views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to OpenBXRX, BronxNet's special coverage providing you the latest information that matters to you during COVID-19, the coronavirus. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, and today is Tuesday, May 19th. Coming up, we'll discuss Bronx Parts, their new rules and regulations, and face covering distributions during COVID-19. Then, the director of Renaissance Youth Center raises concerns for Bronx youth post-COVID. We'll learn what those concerns are and what he thinks should be done for the youth. After that, Neighborhood Association for Intercultural Affairs, NICA, shares more about the rent freeze, eviction moratoriums, and what they're doing to help tenants with housing concerns remotely. And we'll learn how Washington Heights Senior Link is providing volunteer services and resources for seniors remotely. So please stay tuned. Open BXRX starts now. Welcome to OpenBXRX on BronxNet. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, inviting you to get social with us at BronxNet TV on Instagram and Twitter and BronxNet Community Television on Facebook. Also, if you're watching us on cable, you can stay up to date with our on-screen social media feeds, providing the latest COVID-19 community updates and important headlines. According to Google data, more people have been visiting parks to escape quarantine this month. While our Bronx parks remain open, providing face coverings and open green spaces, there are some rules and regulations you should follow when you visit. Here to tell us more is Bronx Parks Commissioner Iris Rodriguez Rosa. Thank you for joining us, Commissioner. Oh, no, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to, uh, to your viewers. Thank you. Of course. We're really glad to have you. Um, I just wanted to start off with just learning about um, New York City Parks during um, COVID-19. How has the operation changed for you? And are all Bronx Parks still open? How have things been? Well, you know, just to be able to share with you that our parks are open. They actually are still open. However, the, the playgrounds are not. The playgrounds, the basketball courts, uh, have been closed since April because that would be a, a difficult way to, to be able to try to social distance. But the major parks, the large parks, you know, you have Cortona Park, you have Van Coyle, Pelham Bay, you have uh, large parks that are open that don't have fences that uh, allow for people to be able to go out and at least get some air and be able to walk around and be able to do that. So, but the playgrounds and of course in the basketball and we're not in the, and the, uh, permits, uh, there's no permits, uh, for active play because we're trying to limit the, folks uh you know not social distancing right and how have things changed for the staff and for you in regards to you know working remotely a little more but you know there's still staff at the parks making sure that everybody's safe oh yes you know and i have to say because i'm very i'm very partial to them i mean i consider our people essential workers as well because they're trying to maintain the the beautiful green spaces and resources that we have here in new york city so for me they are essential workers they they they're not as visible as some of the others of course the 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 health workers and and police and fire and the grocery workers and things like that but our park workers are still out there taking care of our parks and doing whatever it can to try to maintain them Right. And in regards to some rules and regulations that people should follow, what are some of those things that, um, you know, people before heading to a park should know? Well, we ask, we want people to to understand that this is real. This is not something, this is like, you know, we wake up in the morning hoping that it was a nightmare or something like that. But this is a reality that we're all facing uh, in New York City, New York State, throughout the country, in the world. And I think people have to be cognizant that people are doing, our, our elected officials and everyone are doing all they can to be able to educate our people on how they have to be able to be uh, preventive. Uh, prevention, you know, they say an ounce of prevention is it's worth a pound of cure. Um, so that uh, it's important 
it's important for us to be able to uh, understand that and respect that. So we ask people to be able to do social distancing. We know that you may walk around with family members because you live in the same house. So that's understandable, but we're not asking you to join other groupings, okay? Walk out of your house with the mask because you never know where you're going to be at that point. Because they say, oh no, I'm just gonna go out with my family. No, you have to understand that you may come across uh, situations where you need to be able to have your mask. Right. And when we speak about the mask, I know that NYC Parks participated in distributing about a, a lot of um, face coverings. Can you tell us a little bit about that initiative and if it's still happening? It was it was wonderful. So we had we had about I think a two or three uh, different phases of being able to issue masks throughout the city. We we issued about five hundred thousand masks uh, to the public. So it was quite a, a wonderful venture. I'm proud to say that in the Bronx. We made sure that at least there was at least one park, one area that in every community board district uh, and in every council district that we received uh, a supply of masks to be able to be distributed. So we're very proud in the Bronx of having been able to do that. Mm. And um, that sounds amazing. I'm, I'm so glad that NYC Parks was able to, you know, help out the community in that regard. We were all worried because once, you know, the governor said that masks are essential, that we need to absolutely be wearing masks. A lot of people were concerned that they don't have them. Oh, Larry, she has the NYC Parks mask on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Commissioner, I also wanted to ask you about what activities um, you've seen people engaging in at, at parks more than ever now. Well, we, we have people that, that we encourage them to be able to walk around, to still exercise, for people to do walks and runs and do bike rides and things like that, still maintaining social distancing, because it's important uh, for you to still maintain a good physical uh, activities uh, with yourself and with your family. So we still encourage people to be able to get out and get some sun and get some air and, and enjoy the parks, but again, doing it conscientiously and doing it safely. NYC Parks also has an initiative to participate in activities from home. Can you tell us about the parks at home? Oh, well, you know something I said, the Parks Department tries to be exceedingly creative in everything that we do. <laughs> okay, so we try to make sure that we have launched uh, Parks at Home programming and, and Parks at Home Junior. Uh, the Parks at Home programming provides, you know, live park hours, uh, medi uh, medi meditation sessions, fitness, art classes. Uh, for the children, we have visual uh, zoo cams, um, exploration of wildlife, habitats, the many things that people sometimes maybe take for granted, but now that you're home, now you can actually also entertain yourself and understand the things that we do. I think it looks awesome and it sounds amazing. I saw a video on Facebook with some park rangers giving like a tour oh. and like all these trails and all these videos. Absolutely. Yeah. There are many people that don't realize how many wonderful trails we have. We have tons of trails, for example, at Van Corlin Park that are absolutely wonderful. Uh, there are many things to still be out there to enjoy as well. And through these video Zooms and these video programmings, you're able to learn much more that you can try to access. Thank you. And one last thing, Commissioner Rodriguez Rosa, before you go, um, a message for the community on visiting the Bronx parks and staying safe. And um, of course, the emphasis on everyone wearing a mask in the parks. Absolutely. I will continue to say that I think we have the most marvelous uh, park system uh, in, in the world. I mean, this is we have 7000 acres of parkland uh, in the borough of the Bronx alone. Uh, many of them are open spaces and, and we encourage people to still go out there and be able to enjoy them. I go out there myself and I love to see the public enjoying it. And I look forward to for, for people to be able to do that. And I look forward to being out there with you uh, to be able to enjoy it. But safely wear your mask, safe distancing at all times. Thank you so much for your time, Commissioner Rodriguez Rosa. My pleasure, be well. You as well. Folks, to know before you go, you can visit nycgovparks.org for a list of parks department service changes, um, just to you know stay in touch with what's going on at the parks. OpenBXRX, we'll be right back. Who's most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. Al tomar transporte público, no toques su teléfono. Lleve desinfectante para sus manos y úselo inmediatamente al salir del autobús o tren. No te toques la cara. 
Si alguien tose o estornuda, aléjase. Lávese las manos con agua y jabón lo antes posible. Limite el contacto con los postes. Si es posible, evite las horas pico. No comas ni bebas en transporte público. Mantenga su bolsa del piso o otras superficies. Evite tocar directamente los torniquetes. Manténgase al día con lo último de su Departamento de Salud local y el CDC. Welcome back. A local business started producing hand sanitizer in the South Bronx. Our executive director, Michael Max Navi, stopped by to see how Port Morris Distillery, the makers of PMD Pitorro, the Puerto Rican moonshine, turned their business into a hand sanitizer production house during COVID-19. Talk to me, brother. Two weeks ago, if you would have told me, I didn't want to leave my house. And now, now I can say I'm technically a part of the front lines. Once you guys come in, I'll lock it up. Port Morris Distillery is a micro distillery. We actually create alcohol in the South Bronx. We're actually the only distillery in the South Bronx right now. My partner and I, Billy, we were born and raised on the Upper West Side in the Douglas Housing Projects. The South Bronx, we've been in business here a little over 12 years now. We used to do tours and tastings in here. Um, we create a spirit here that's called Pitoro, which is a Puerto Rican moonshine. We also own the Bronx Tavern that's right next door. That's been closed for the last four to five weeks now. Before the pandemic, this was a nice place to come hang out, listen to music, have cocktails, food. Um, you can also do tours, um, visit the facility, see exactly how we make it. The warehouse was more set up more like a lounge area where you can come, you know, play dominoes, um, have some drinks, drink some beer, and, you know, just hang out. A nice libation spot. There's definitely music, definitely culture. You know, there was a Latin culture, but we say everything culture. Like, you know, everyone everyone is definitely accepted in here. Definitely a nice spot to, to come visit. Oh, no, there, there was no uh, um, adapt for us. We realized that, you know, probably about four to six, six months away from totally just closing down. We closed our doors down, um, I think about five to six days before anyone else did. And then the city just, just shut down. I mean, it hit us hard. I mean, we had a staff of maybe about 14 to 15 at the time between us and the Bronx Tavern. And um, every, you know, we just laid everyone off and, and you know, that's it. You know, it's just, you know, taking a toll on, on everybody. The first two weeks, I guess everybody was just in shock and we just want, didn't want to go anywhere. My partner calls me and he was like, you know, I think we should um, start, start making hand sanitizer. At the same time, my daughter Kelsey was on board with just creating the online store because we did have some inventory that we were just trying to get rid of just to try to, you know, pay, pay a, maybe another month or two months rent. The FDA and the TTB, which is our regulator and New York State Liquor Authority, they allowed us to start selling hand sanitizer and also mass producing it. So that's when we jumped on board within the last two weeks, took the WHO's um, hand sanitizer recipe. It's really just, you know, pungent alcohol, 160 proof with a little bit of lotion and some hydrogen peroxide to kill germs and bacteria. We just put it together here at the distillery and we said, yeah, you know, we can do it, let's make it. And we went full force with it and just started going in bulk. For the last two weeks, what we've been doing was just distilling spirits and alcohol and just to try to get our um, bulk up. Everything just coincided with us making the spirits, uh, us blending the spirit, us blending the alcohol, creating the hand sanitizer, receiving bottles from Chicago so we can start selling and start selling in bulk. So we launched the online store, but actually um, crashed yesterday because we just couldn't hold the demand. So we just had to relaunch the website. We added more packs. So now you can get um, the one gallon in a four pack instead of just purchasing one gallon. So that'll be most effective um, for people all around. So we are available for shipping in all 50 states and in Puerto Rico, so that's pretty cool. The response has been amazing. We left some room there so where we can give away some hand sanitizer. Yeah, I reached out to the Hispanic Society and the NYPD, the 4-0 precinct, give some out to our local restaurants that are still in business. We've just donated a five gallon drum to a ministry that has a food bank. It's hard right now. We still have to pay rent. We still have to pay our creditors. We've paid our bills this month. It's tough, man. Um, small businesses right now are not getting help. So it's really not advice. It's just, I hope we can all make it through here. We really didn't have a game plan. This was just something that was given to us by By, the, by New York State, and they actually gave us this lifeline. The making the hand sanitizer is probably going to keep us in business. My hope is we can either get more testing or find a cure to this. Visit our website, social media, PMD Pitorro, hashtag sanitizer. You're going you're to see us on there, pormorsistillery.com, or you know, Instagram, PMD Pitorro. Tough time. It's an emotional time, I think, for all of us. I'm sure that the South Bronx is going to do, you know, that the Bronx is going to do its thing because that's just the way we, we are. So X is up all the time.
My brother, thank, thank you, man. No, I appreciate you, man. Thank you, brother. Welcome back to Open BXRX. With Mayor de Blasio's budget cuts suspending much of the city's summer youth programming and reevaluating funding for nonprofits, administrative costs, programs like Renaissance Youth Center fear the impact on young people post COVID 19. Here to discuss is President and CEO of Renaissance Youth Center, Mr. Bervin Harris. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Harris. How are you, Ms. Lopez? Good to see you. I'm doing well, and I see you as well. I want to get straight into it. We already know the work that Renaissance Youth Center has been doing for the past years, a um, couple of years. Can you just give us a little bit of background for any viewer who's not familiar? Sure. We've been around for about 20 years. We're located here in the South Bronx on 3rd Avenue between 167 and 168th Street. Uh, we're also in about 28 different public schools doing music programs, dance programs, and music production and education. So we have about 4,000 young people we work with a week. And so we also, a lot of us have seen the MWAM band, the Music with a Message band, everywhere from Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and each show that's happening in the Bronx, you will often see these young people. We have a youth council that represents every precinct council meeting here in the Bronx. So we're pretty active. In addition to that, we do um, after school programming, which is something we're very prideful about as well. Right. And Mr. Harris, I wanted to learn about the challenges and the impact to the program due to COVID-19. Um, how do you continue to operate through the pandemic? Well, one of the things we were asked by the city is to stay open. Um, so we're, we have been open through the whole pandemic for a very small amount of young people. Speaking specifically for those who are ESL learning, uh, students who have no way of uh, getting through the online lessons. We have kids who don't have computers still. We have kids that don't have internet capabilities. We have those that we are very much aware of that they weren't coming here. They might not get a good meal for the day. So it's a very, very small group. We didn't interchange that group. We didn't shift out with staff. And I feel very blessed that the circle has not yet been broken. No one has been sick. And we've been able to help so many young people. I'm so happy to hear that and that, you know, everybody's doing well and these programs are still available to many of the children that absolutely need them. I wanted to ask you about your concerns um, and thoughts. I saw a video that you shared on Instagram regarding um, the cancellation of SYEP and summer youth programs. Um, what are your concerns and what do you think should happen in place of the cancellations? Yeah, the cancellation kind of fears all of us. If you walk around our communities, you will even see gang tagging starting to take place. And for those of us who've been around the community long enough, we know what that means. That means there are new sets developing and people are marking territory. So violence usually follows. And if you give people you know, an idle mind, then it becomes a, what we say the devil's playground. And so when you take away parks, you take away beaches, you take away after school, you take away summer youth employment, you take away summer camps, you take away museums, you've left nothing. And with nothing, then we're going to find things or people will find things to do. And they're usually not good things. So it did concern me of mayhem taking place here in the South Bronx. And so one of the things we've been doing is trying to be active to raise our own funds. Right. And um, how can you, um, what do you suggest in place of like these interpersonal um, programs, which is the concern, right, for social distancing and all of these measures? Um, how can programs like, uh, as you know, summer programs and um, Renaissance Youth Center apply to this remote, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know, yeah. the situation <laughs> that we're in right now. It's hard to explain. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. You know what is funny? It's hard to make plays when the when the game, the rules of the game constantly keeps changing. Um, but I, I can tell you a couple of things that we're doing. One of the things that we're doing is, it, is that uh, nonprofit organizations and schools really need to compete against the quality of YouTube. So if you ask our young people, where are they doing, what are they doing? Everybody's on YouTube, but they're on YouTube doing things that maybe you shouldn't really be doing, or it's maybe it's not the most advantageous thing for you to do. So one of the things we're doing, we've actually hired a production team to do what we call RYC Virtual Online. And it's gonna be out of this world, so stay tuned. It'll be up another 30 days, um, but it's that intricate of a piece we're trying to do to get all those kids to not look at all this other stuff, but come here and still learn about STEM, still learn about music, still learn about robotics in a very fun, productive, quality way. The other thing is we wanna obey the law of the land, right? And so we intend on gathering. Gatherings will happen. The mayor mentioned today, which was very refreshing to hear, they're gonna have cooling systems, um, sites um, because of these hot days that are coming, which means there'll be gatherings. Uh, they talk about the, the passive parks will be opening with sprinklers. So we wanna bring these kids in, have them spend time with us, do things that are quality for them, 
If a park opens, we'll take it to the park. If there's a street that's open, we'll come to the streets. And we'll obey the law of the land and, and, and exercise the social distancing that the mayor and the governor is laying out, but we'll be able to do it in a high quality way here at our program. That all sounds amazing. I also wanted to ask about, um, you know, some of the youth, how have they been feeling in social isolation? Have they been, you know, a little bit stressed? You know, mentally, a lot of people are affected by all of this. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because all of us aren't thinking about that. We feel like, hey, kids are off from school. Kids are having a ball. Yeah, they had a ball for the first couple of weeks. Um, everybody's going cray cray. Uh, <laughs> parents are going crazy <laughs> and the kids are going crazy. Um, we're looking at post-traumatic stress disorders that's going to be happening. Uh, mental health is going to go, is, is very rampant. I Zoom with some of my kids and to hear some of my children tell me that they have not stepped foot out of the apartment wow. for the whole entirety of the time. Our kids are dealing with post-traumatic stress. Our kids are dealing with uh, ACS not going into the buildings and fear of the COVID. Uh, you got domestic violence that is up. You know, so there's nobody really addressing those matters. I won't say nobody, but it's not enough. And so that is really not our, our, our call to action, but it's our call to action now. And I think, and if I could send out a message to any nonprofit, any health facility, any do-gooder, this is a time for us to redefine whatever our missions may have been. And if we're not answering to this call, then we're not, we shouldn't be doing this line of work. Wow. You know, that's how I look at it. It really is a time. It defines um, a lot of what our youth needs. Um, and, you know, you've been doing this work for years now, but the fact that, you know, the connection is, is still there for the children and for the youth, regardless of the, you know, the factors that we have in place is, is amazing. And, and, you know, thank you for that. I wanted thank to you. ask you, uh, Mr. Harris, if the, the scholarship a-thon is still happening, how can people donate? How can people, you know, help out and, and assist with all the, the, the powerful work that you're doing? Thank you so much for that. So the scholarship a -thon is not happening right now. That's where the kids raise their own funds to go to school and college. However, we have this big fundraising going on for the summer program. And so we're going to launch starting this Monday. So the timing is perfect right about now on our GoFundMe page. And so it's going to be at what RYC Summer 20. RYC Summer 20 um, GoFundMe. And so I'm very happy to in big ups to Broadcom who gave us, after seeing that video that you're talking about, they gave us $50,000 wow. and they're gonna match whatever people give. And so folks, if you give $10, that means technically you're giving 20 bucks. <laughs> um, so please log in. I know we can do this. I'm not fretting this at all. We're gonna come together as a community. We're gonna raise these funds for our young people um, and for our families because we're gonna give give and go bags as well. You know, um, whether it's, you know, sanitizers or masks or toilet paper or just food that we really want to eat, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> Definitely. Any final messages for the community and for the youth from Mr. Bourbon Harris? Well, I guess my final message is big ups to everybody. I mean, we pulled through this um, in spite. I know our numbers here are record breaking here in the South Bronx. But what people aren't realizing is that we're living on top of each other. You know, we have like six, seven folk living in a two bedroom apartment. Uh, when we are the frontline workers as well. So when you go to these stores and you go to these different places, it's the black and brown folk that you see. So our numbers are going to be high, higher. But I want to say I really respect and I support what I've seen from our community, the, safe, the social distancing. We're six feet apart, lining up to get into the post office, so on and so forth. <laughs> two, two thumbs up. I can't give two right now because I was holding the thumb, uh, holding the phone. But big ups. And we will get through this. And, and one of the things I was saying in closing um, before this COVID, because we were going through a lot here as an organization, I kept saying that this too shall pass. And you know what? It has strengthening me to understand that even through this COVID, that this too shall pass. Of course, we're in it together out here in the South Bronx. So thank you, Mr. Harris, for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Appreciate you. Folks, to find out more about Renaissance Youth Center and see how you can support, visit renaissanceyouth.org and follow them on Instagram at Renaissance Youth Center. Open BXRX, we'll be right back. Is the Bronx the new hotspot for COVID-19? District Manager for Community Board 12, George Torres, in responding to a recent report by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, says the numbers here speak for themselves. Numbers showing that among the top 15 zip codes showing residents citywide who have tested positive for COVID-19, not only are there eight in the Bronx, Torres is looking at some challenging news for his district. 
the top three zip codes in the Bronx that are afflicted by this, uh, 10467, 10469, 10466, which all happen to be here in Community Board 12, there are no testing sites. This despite the fact that next to Corona Queens at the number one spot with 4,054 testing positive, the Bronx's 10467 is second with the Norwood section outside the district while Olinville is within, coming in at a combined 3,061 cases. Fourth is 10469 with 2,769 cases in Baychester that falls within the district along with Allerton and Pelham Gardens. In 11th place is 10466 in the Wakefield, Edenwald, and East Chester sections with 2,174 testing positive. I think what this virus has done is really expose the inequities that we already knew in this community existed. So the only thing that was very surprising was um, the city's approach to it. An approach that has failed to match the urgent care needed for is roughly 157,000 residents, the majority of whom are African and Caribbean American. When they started rolling out the free giveaway for the mask and for the gloves and stuff like that, they weren't in this district. Mm -hmm. um, they did one last week on Thursday, I believe that was the 8th, May 8th, mm -hmm. um, at Haffin Park. That was the first one that they had did at the district. And again, when I think you should be driven by data, and if you know, especially here in the Bronx, that we are suffering um, and minority communities especially are suffering, um, you should be focusing your efforts on addressing those issues. He says he was hopeful early on after Montefiore Medical Center set up three drive through testing sites in Bay Plaza Mall, the Bronx Zoo and Lehman College, but that hope turned to disappointment. Maybe two weeks after that, they said, oh, we're going to start doing testing at Edenwald Housing Development, which is in my district. Um, but again, that was two weeks too late, um, and it was only focused on Edenwald. I mean, we're talking about a much larger district, and I think the concern with many of us in the district is that all the testing sites that they have right now, one, they tell you you, can only, you have to be symptomatic. You have to have some, something going on so you can call and make the appointment. Um, but you also have to drive. The immediate need, he says, is a walk-in clinic, preferably on Westchester Avenue, to make it easy for subway commuters on their way home. I have two end-of-line trains here. I have the t number two train, which ends on 241st Street, and then I have the uh, Dyer Avenue number five train that ends on Dyer Avenue. So we have these situations where our constituents, my constituents, are forced to take the train and public transportation to get to locations. And I've heard from one too many people, like, oh, I can't go to Co-op City because they're only doing tr drive-through testing, or I can't go to Lehman College because they're doing drive-through testing. He also wants to address the poor food options in a community with a large amount of bodegas and fast food eateries and too few fresh food markets. We reached out to the city to find out about testing sites in Community Board 12 and are waiting to hear back. For BronxNet, this is Arlene Makoko. When Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that Muslims throughout New York City were receiving 400,000 free halal meals during Ramadan, many were relieved. One of Ramadan's most noble callings is to feed the hungry. And it's a crucial part of how the holiday is celebrated, to remember to be there for those in need. For folks who need halal meals... There will be 32 of those DOE sites in particular focused where there are large Muslim communities. 400,000 meals available. Another 100,000 will be distributed through partnerships with community-based organizations, food uh, pantries, soup kitchens. However, some of those halal meals look like this. And while community members and activists acknowledge that many city food sites are providing good, adequate meals, they now ask for accountability for those that are not. There's a lot of great programs that we're hearing about at the schools. There's school school meal pickups um, that's available every day. And there's the New York City Food Delivery Assistance Program that I actually was sending a lot of people to. But I have not received great feedback from those who've used it. And so, you know, we decided to do a little bit of digging. And we found out that the food that is being provided is not really great. It's not really um, nutritious. It's not really fresh. In response to the impact of COVID-19 in the Bronx, Tahita Mariam founded the Bronx Mutual Aid Network, 
a volunteer-run initiative supplying and delivering groceries to the most vulnerable, including the Muslim community. In this moment of need where there's so many black and brown communities that are um, going hungry, we need to make sure that we preserve the dignity in the food and the um, essential groceries that people should be receiving. Mutual aid networks are, you know, providing a lot of goods that families can hold on to, that families can, like, use for at least, like, a week or two to feed their families, sometimes longer. When organizers like Mariam discovered that the halal food provided by the city came from a military contractor, she and other community members suggested that the city should model their food distribution after community-led efforts instead of contracts. If the city adopted this model of like giving the basic um, grocery items or maybe even like a fand- pandemic um, food voucher of some sort so that people can go and get groceries, fresh groceries, especially those who are not eligible for city programs. I think that would be really beneficial. If you or someone you know needs help, or if you would like to volunteer, donate, and support the Bronx Mutual Aid Network, visit chuffed.org slash project slash BX Mutual Aid, or follow them on Instagram at BX Mutual Aid Network. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. Welcome back to Open BXRX. With many people losing their jobs due to COVID-19, one of their main concerns have been housing and how tenants can afford their rent. Since 1974, the Neighborhood Association for Intercultural Affairs, NICA, has been providing housing intervention and assistance services to residents of the Bronx since 1974. Here to discuss how they've moved to serve Bronx residents remotely and more is Marlene Valarezo, Executive Director of Legal Services at NICA. Thank you for joining us, Marlene. Hi, how are you? It's nice to I'm meet you. I'm doing well. Nice meeting you as well. So the first thing I wanted to start off with was just the, the mission of NICA, learning a little bit more about the background. Well, like you you said already, um, we've been around since 1974. We're a non-for-profit community-based organization. We provide legal representation as well as client-centered housing, legal, and social support services that seek to improve the quality of the life of Bronx residents as well as encourage self-sufficiency. And straight off the bat, Marlon, what are some of the challenges that NICA is facing right now with their tenants and I mean, the people that they that you assist legally and with housing issues? Um, what are some of those challenges that people are, are calling you regarding, um, you know, COVID-19 and the rent? Well, we've had broad spectrum calls. Um, we have clients who are calling because they have faced unemployment. They've lost their wages. There's been reduction in wages. They've been furloughed. So now, of course, they cannot pay their rent. We also have people who just calling because of self-isolation. They are fearful. And, and rent is one more item to fear, but they have many more fears. I mean, they have to maintain internet for their children who are school age, who are now being homeschooled. They have to pay rent. They have to pay for food. They have to pay for Con Edison. There's a multitude of issues they're facing, and it's becoming a mental health issue for Bronx residents at this point. It definitely is. And the fact that people are concerned about the rent is just, you know, a lot of there's a lot of rent cancellation um, petitions and protesting happening in order to get that load off of a lot of people's backs. Can you tell us about some of the services and resources at NICA that people can receive remotely? Currently, our staff attorneys are representing tenants remotely in Bronx Housing Court via Skype. So tenants can contact NICA and they will be assigned a staff attorney who can represent them on these emergency actions that are currently being heard via Skype. They can also contact NICA on our hotline day, which is Wednesday, nine to five. And regardless of whether you're in court or regardless of your borough, you can be connected to a staff attorney who will discuss your housing matters. And so that everyone knows, they can contact 311 Monday through Friday um, to discuss housing matters and they will be connected to any legal services provider who is currently um, manning the hotline. Right. Marlon, can you clarify, um, you know, the changes in the eviction moratorium with Governor Andrew Cuomo? What what changes can people expect to face and how how would this affect people? Well, the first uh, executive order that Governor Cuomo signed stayed all evictions from March 20th through June 20th meant no one could get evicted. Currently, he signed a new moratorium, a new executive order, which we thought would extend the moratorium to August 20th. But in fact, It did extend it, but on a limited basis. So what it did is that those who are commercial residential tenants with non-payments 
right. who are facing eviction, who have cases where they owe rent, but have to have been affected by COVID related hardship or have applied for unemployment. That narrows the criteria because in the first order, it was for all Bronx residents facing eviction, or all city residents facing eviction. Now it's saying, unless you're facing eviction for a non-payment and have been affected by COVID, you're in danger after June 20th of being evicted. Wow. And just to be clear, um, folks would have to provide that proof that they have been affected by COVID-19, right? Exactly. And that's what we're trying to figure out. What exact proof would they require? And when would they require said proof? So should tenants be contacting their landlords now to say, I've been affected by COVID-19, I've lost my job, or someone within the home? Remember, sometimes you have two working parents in the home, or even more than one family residing in a home, and they rely on each and every paycheck. So if one person has lost their income, can they supply that to show that they've been affected by COVID, which has caused a hardship? Right. We're very fearful for the people of the Bronx and throughout the city after June 20th, because we do not know. It's been very up, um, upended question for all of us as to what will happen. Right, and another concern, Marlene, is that the news is coming in so fast. Um, how has NICA been taking all of this, you know, the surge of the news coming in and getting this information out to your clients? Well, thank goodness all of our staff are working remotely and have taken all their client files home with them. So mm -hmm. when we get information, as soon as we are sent it from HRA, Human Resources Administration, or Judge Marks um, from New York City court system, or from any any other politicians have been sending us information, we distribute that to our, to our clients, as well as to our staff. First to my staff, who can then distribute it to their client base. Got it. And when we talk about the Rent Guidelines Board, um, they recently held a preliminary vote in favor of rent freeze. What does it mean? What are the details? And who does it apply to? Well, currently in New York, there's just about under 1 million apartments that are rent stabilized. And if you live in an apartment that was in a building that was built before 1974 and has six units or more, you're most likely in a rent stabilized apartment. You can always find out from going to the Department of Homeless Community Renewal, um, DHCR, but you can also call 311 and you can find out more information on whether your apartment is rent stabilized. Rent stabilized apartments can only increase by a percentage, which is determined by the Rent Guidelines Board. They meet later on in June late June, they tend to meet and they will decide if there's going to be an increase or a rent freeze. We're encouraging a rent freeze right now because people have enough on their plate with everything going on than to also have to think about an increase in their rent. At least this will be one issue where they can have some peace of mind that their rent is not going to increase in October because when they meet in June, those rent increases go into effect later this year in October. Got it. And Marlon, can we talk about the battle between tenants and landlords right now with tenants organizing and striking, urging Governor Cuomo to um, cancel the rent? What are some of the main concerns the community has in regards to their li living situations in this regard? And how can this be resolved? Do you think a rent can cancellation will help all parties involved, including tenants and landlords? Currently, unemployment rates in New York State are the highest they've been since the Great Depression. This is leaving a lot of people without the ability to pay for rent, food, Internet, which they must maintain for school-aged children, um, Con Edison. So all these factors are why they're leading to call for rent cancellation. I agree with the rent cancellation because many people are not gonna even know how to feed their families if they also have to pay for rent. But I also in conjunction would like to call for, the, for Governor Cuomo to cancel mortgages for the landlords. This would mean that a cancellation would help save families from eviction while also preventing landlords from losing their buildings which would end the battle between landlords and tenants and provide relief for all the, all the people in our community. Right. And now Marlon, um, one last question. How can people get in contact with NICA um, for housing and legal services? How can people reach out um, in order to get some help and assistance? Well, NICA, we have our website, so you can always go on nicany.org, but we're also available by phone. Please call 718-538-3344. You can call extension 100, extension 117, or extension 500. You can also reach us via email at legal at nycany.org. And we are on Facebook. We are on Instagram at nica1974. So please, we encourage you to reach out. All our information for contact information is on all those um, forums. And you can reach out to us. And like I said, our staff attorneys are being assigned to cases. And we will represent you remotely via Skype. 
So we are still handling Bronx housing court matters. Thank you so much, Marlon, for your time today. Thank you. It was great <laughs> meeting you. Nice meeting you as well. Folks, if you need housing and legal services, again, the website is nikany.org. OpenBXRX will be right back. Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. The United States is on the brink of possibly the worst economic recession since the Great Depression during the 1930s. Over 20 million jobs were lost in the month of April, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. However, as states begin to slowly reopen, the stock market is on its way up again. The S&P 500 spiked 31 percent and now trades at 22.5 times projected earnings, proving that Wall Street has bounced back. However, for the average consumer, stocks might not be a part of your daily life. But as the economy slowly begins to recover, business consultants like Spencer Tribble are advising people on how they can take advantage of the market during this time. I think it's a great time to invest in the stock market at this time because you practically are getting some great performing companies at a discounted price. Companies like Delta and Southwest at this current day and time that still stand completely strong as far as financial, uh, their financial status, et cetera. So they will be able to like withstand this, this crisis. Tribble says it's important to him that more people of color gain financial literacy on stocks and how to invest in the market. Because a lot of our, you know, grandparents, uh, the generations that came before us, they didn't, they didn't teach us these things, right? And so they didn't really have these conversations with us and really talk about the importance of that. The more we can get, you know, people on board with, you know, obtaining the knowledge and then applying it, the better off we can be, you know, as it pertains to uh, the black community as a whole. If you're interested in learning more about how you can invest in the market during this time, Tribble holds weekly Zoom classes and one on one walkthrough sessions for first time investors. Reporting for BronxNet, Darissa White. Welcome back to Open BXRX. Social isolation is a tough reality that many people, particularly seniors, are facing. But being away physically doesn't mean that we can't stay connected. Washington Heights Senior Link is a community-based organization targeting social isolation, emotional well-being, and oral health care among older adults practicing social distancing during COVID-19. Joining us now to share more is Jennifer Strauss, co-founder of WH Senior Link. Thank you for joining us today, Jennifer. Thank you again for having me. Of course. One of the first things we want to learn about from the jump is um, just tell us a little bit more about Washington Heights Senior Link, your mission, and how it began. Sure. So this all really started as a conversation between my co-founders, Danny Spencer Late, Amanda Weiss, and me in the beginning of the pandemic. We'd all previously had experience working with older adults through various professional and volunteering uh, opportunities. And so we understood that this, this was a population facing a social isolation as a public health issue. Even before the pandemic, we knew that 25% uh, of seniors could be characterized as socially isolated, according to the National Academy of Sciences, and 43% uh, of them reported feeling lonely. So when we formed WH Senior Link, our mission was really to mitigate social isolation um, and uh, among older adults in New York City, and also uh, to connect them with local community resources we also knew that in order to reach many of these older adults, we would need to utilize older techniques. So that included traditional phone calls, snail mail letters, and, and packages. And we received a small grant from Columbia University that helped us get our start in Washington Heights. And now we're expanding into other areas of Manhattan and the Bronx. 
Wonderful. I love that the mission, you know, um, focuses on using older techniques, like you said, because a lot of seniors are left out of these communications and these um, this information that's being sent out um, during COVID-19. So, you know, that sounds incredible. Um, I read somewhere that um, apart from, you know, the psychological stress, it also social isolation also impacts physical health. Um, I read that, uh, let me just look at my notes real quick. It's linked to higher blood pressure, more susceptibility to the flu and infectious diseases and earlier onset of dementia. So, you know, all of these factors that are affecting our seniors and the stress with COVID-19 on top of that is is really, really a, a tough challenge. Yeah, exactly. Can you tell us about the challenges that, um, you know, seniors, particularly in Northern Manhattan and the Bronx are also facing? Uh, yeah, so in addition to what you mentioned, the general social isolation and loneliness that are byproducts of social isolation of social distancing, we chose Northern Manhattan and the Bronx because these areas contain neighborhoods that have higher higher rates of senior poverty on average, and uh, they have larger proportions of folks who are undocumented and people who might not might have less access to some of the public benefits that it could address some of these issues. Um, and something that we've also been learning from our seniors is that a lot of them live in older city buildings that are not very accessible to those who use wheelchairs, which is, of course, a problem regardless of the pandemic. But it's especially challenging when inviting neighbors over and asking uh, for help from others can also mean risking exposure. Right. Um, what are some of the services that WH Senior Link is providing right now for those that need it? So we have a cohort of multilingual volunteers that provide weekly phone calls, care packages, and letters. Um, included in those care packages and letters are several various resource guides that we've compiled that include things like coping strategies, a list of phone numbers that people can call if they need assistance with food supply or mental health care, uh, and even a guide to oral health care. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, additionally, we're also building a directory of seniors who are interested in peer support so that we can actually pair seniors who share similar interests and spoken languages with each other for more of a mutual aid option. Jennifer, I also understand that you're seeking volunteers to participate and help out um, with this initiative. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, we're, we're always looking to grow our cohort of volunteers and anyone who's able to give up their time right now to create these, relation these uh, relationships with older adults can find us on our website, whseniorlink.org. And there's a very simple, easy to fill out volunteer application there. Um, we're also looking if, if people have other areas of expertise that they think could be helpful to the cause, then uh, definitely include that in your application because we're a very small team and can use all the help we can get. Um, and it's also important to note that we cover 100% of the costs of the care packages, including shipping, so that this opportunity can be completely free and completely remote to for our volunteers. Um, that being said, because of that, uh, in order to expand, we really are looking to increase our funding so that we can provide more of these care packages and enlist and, and have more seniors join us. Uh, so any help that people can provide by donating to our Chuffed campaign would really help us out. Right. And let me just give that Chuffed campaign link right here. Um, that is chuffed.org slash project slash support dash older dash new dash Yorkers. And that's right here on the bottom of the screen in case you you're able to donate to WH Senior Link at this time. Um, Jennifer, I also wanted to ask you, um, how can seniors or family members that you know have older adults in their family and have concerns, how can they access these resources for help? Sure, so they can get connected with us by calling our number, which is 917-740-2194. Uh, on our website, we also have a senior interest form that seniors can either fill out themselves or they can ask a family member or neighbor to uh, submit it for them. Right. And thank you so much. Finally, to close out, um, can you just tell us about the importance of community led volunteer run services like WH Senior Link, especially right now during COVID-19? Sure. Uh, I think this pandemic has really highlighted how many inequities, social inequities there are in our city. And uh, a lot of the structures in place are really overwhelmed right now. And I think the only way that we can better ensure that people don't fall through the cracks is by engaging in community outreach and community organizing. Uh, additionally, we also believe that the 
mutual benefit that comes from participating in programs like this really can't be understated. I mean, we definitely hope to make a difference in the lives of these older adults, uh, but we also hope that our volunteers are finding a sense of connection and learning from folks with whom they wouldn't have otherwise connected. And building these collaborative, caring relationships is incredibly important right now uh, during this really difficult and isolating time. And we just really hope that this can be a source of strength to everyone in the community. I absolutely think it is. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time today. Thank you again. Again, folks, to find out more about Washington Heights Senior Link, you can visit whseniorlink.org and follow them on Instagram at whseniorlink. That's all for our show today. Thank you for tuning in to BXRX. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, wishing you and your family safety and wellness now and always. Until next time.